Hey guys, Desert Magic here, and pre-release time is coming up soon for Eldritch Moon. I've been to quite a few pre-releases myself, so I've uh, developed a couple tips to help you save time, do better, hopefully win some prizes, and also, of course, have fun. Now, I've made other videos in the past, you know, with stupid stuff that everybody always says, like, get enough sleep, plan accordingly, make sure you have, um, you know, transportation, all the obvious stuff, that's kind of easy. So I decided to collect up a couple of my absolute top pro tips. Now a lot of these are really, really subtle, but they will give you just enough of an advantage that hopefully you can use it to win. Now you only have around like 30 minutes to build your deck. I forgot what the exact standard time is, but honestly by the time the boosters are open and the cards are sorted, it ain't much. I mean, I tend to take about, I don't know, two days to build my decks. So, like, 20-25 minutes, uh, that's not a whole lot. What you should do, first of all, is make piles that contain 16 of every color land, because, uh, 16 out of 40 is pretty much maximum ratio to cast, you know, a higher average casting cost deck, which this probably will be. You might be able to get away with 15 as well, but you don't want to completely fail to get off the ground by having, uh, uh, mana problems. I mean, it's better to get mana flooded and just have a good board state with really good cards than to get completely mana screwed. So have that many lands on you so you don't have to stand in line and get them from the community pool, uh, from your LGS, which is the normal way to do it. And then you have to remember to unsleeve your deck at the end of the day when you're really super tired and want to go home. And give the lands back. So it's a lot simpler to just use your own lands, have them sorted, have them ready, and have them in your bag or in your pocket or whatever. Now you've probably all heard this tip, but what you might not consider is that you should buy a hundred sleeves. So two packs of 50 or, you know, a pack of a hundred dragon sleeves. Uh, I prefer a certain brand. I actually don't remember the name of it. Uh, they come in... 80 packs so that would not work quite as well but basically what you want to do is if you can get your hands on 100 sleeves put sleeves on eight of every single land now i usually end up with obviously a two color deck uh, that's the most typical i really wouldn't go to three unless you've got a lot of fixing so i end up with eight and eight lands simple simple so i've already got eight sleeve now if i absolutely have to because of you know a lot of double cast cost which is really not even in these two sets you could easily go 7 and 9 if you really feel like you're uh, balanced that way, card-wise and cost-wise. And all you have to do is just take one land out of a sleeve and re-sleeve one land. That's only re-sleeving one card. So what you do is once you've figured out your colors, boom, you grab your sleeve ones, leave the other uh, three stacks of eight sleeve lands, just completely ignore them, don't put them in your deck, just don't get them anywhere near your uh, actual deck, obviously, because, you know, they're matching sleeves and you don't want to end up with the wrong color. I've actually done this. Uh, I did it on X-Mage. I added the wrong color of land. I ended up winning, too. That was hilarious. Now, you might not think that, you know, sleeving 16 cards will save you some time, but it will. It's an extra one, two, maybe three minutes to consider your piles and just make sure that you can get to your opponent on time. And also, it leaves you enough time to make absolutely sure that you can recount your deck right before you play with it and make sure that it's 40 cards. You do not want to get stuck with, like, 37 cards, get called on it, and get disqualified. That would be really bad. So that's kind of my next tip. Before anything else, when you think you're done... Count your deck. Make sure it's 40. I don't care if you have to do it right in front of your opponent. No matter if there's time or not, count your deck. In fact, if your opponent's deck looks awfully thin, count that. Um, you can stack up exactly 40 cards. And then uh, if you're familiar with the brands of sleeves, and obviously you know they didn't double sleeve theirs, if theirs looks a little bit wrong, just say, hey, you mind if we count that real quick? And if they say yes, then you definitely want to call over the judge and have it counted because they are purposely playing with like 35 cards. And trust me, if you get two or three big bombs and then reduce your deck size by five, your chances of winning go through the roof. And I've seen people try to cheat like that, which is just unbelievable. They've already got a giant advantage and now they're trying to press it. But of course, like I mentioned before, at my former local gaming store that I used to attend, I'd say about a third of the players were regular cheaters. So you pretty much had to call them out on everything and they could get caught 30 times. The staff doesn't give a damn. If that happens to you, do what I did and find a new local gaming store. Another great tip I have is uh, obviously to look at the cards ahead of time. Everybody says that. Go online, look at the spoiler sites. But that's an awful lot of cards. I think it's uh, 205. You're probably not going to remember that many. But what you should do is read your opponent's cards, especially if you think they might be misplaying them or if they're just really complicated or if they're like, hey, I'm going to throw this creature out and then clearly it has a second ability or a triggered ability. You're going to want to read it and then remember it. Now, if you get beat by it, yeah, you're going to remember what it does. A lot of people remember what Triskaidecaphobia does. 
after the Shadows over Innistrad pre-release, that is, of course. I mean, one guy got it out. Burn from within, 13. Pass, he lost. That was a fun match. Now, there is one more tip that a lot of people don't mention because it's such an interesting trick and an interesting ambush that a lot of people who are extremely, extremely good at pre-release and quick deck building uh, pull on people. As far as I know and from what I've heard from absolutely everybody, the sideboard limit for 40 card sealed, um, limited, I guess you'd call it, whatever, pre-release format, I don't know what it's called. The sideboarding rule is you can swap out as many cards as you want. So what they do is they take one 40 card deck and swap it out for another 40 card deck. So they're playing green red and, uh, oh, it's not working out because, uh, you know, counter spells are killing all their burn or they can't keep anything on the field. So they literally sideboard in an entire new deck for round two that's like black white. So if you really want, I mean, I'd only recommend doing this if you're super pro at picking out cards and building decks. And plus then you have to split the colorless equipment and it gets kind of messy. Build a second deck. Now, if you run out of time, and you will, there's a little bit of like a rule-bending gray area thing that you can do. Between round one and two, if you just completely got demolished, or even if you won and you just remember, hey, my black and uh, green cards are really good. Like, I almost wish I would have built them that way. It's probably as good. Build your second deck between rounds. Um, your card pool is your sideboard. So you built your like 40-ish card deck and the other, I don't know, 100 cards or whatever. That's your sideboard. It's all considered your sideboard. You don't have to actually build like a 15 card sideboard because everything is your sideboard. You can swap out whatever you want as long as you return your deck to the original state uh, at the end of the round. So there's no actual rule against sleeving the cards that are potentially in your sideboard. So you could sit there and build a second deck and be like, okay, here's my uh, green black deck that I just made. Now you can't switch to it. You still have to play with your original deck. But when it comes to sideboard, if you know you have no chance against them because you're playing burn and they're playing control, uh, swapping your super blitz mass summoning aggro deck that you just built with a whole bunch of, you know, 1-1 one, one death touchers and whatever else is in those two colors right now. And you stand a pretty good chance of uh, winning round two and three. I've seen a lot of people do that. I'm like, what are you doing? Like, you're changing your deck between rounds? Because you really can't do that. I mean, some local gaming stores are kind of loose. They're friendly to new people. They don't want somebody to get stuck with some just horrific, horrific deck and then have to play it out. But I'm very certain that the rules say that you can't actually do that. So I'm, you know, asking people, I'm like, no, I'm building a second deck. And I'm like, why? And he said, because I can sideboard it in. I thought, oh my god, you can build a second sideboard or sleeve up your sideboard or pick out and sort your sideboard between rounds because that's all you're really doing. People might not like it, but hey, it's allowed, it's a strategy, deal with it. Now one bonus tip that um, I do actually follow, even though I have a boatload of cards uh, that are in my trade binder, it's a pretty big significant trade binder. Uh, the tip is don't bring your trade binder. Don't bring any trades at all. If you're after some cards, hey, bring dice, bring accessories, bring sleeves, you know, bring maybe 5, 10 cards if you really want to trade them. Because you only really have the rest of the week to trade with other people to build your next deck or, I guess, one half day? Like, if you pick up your booster box of Eldritch Moon on uh, Friday morning, you have until Friday night, basically, to build your new deck. So yeah, people want to trade, but guess what? You're going to see a whole bunch of people at your local gaming store that you've never seen before, and they're probably just there to steal your stuff. This happens at every Grand Prix and every Pro Tour. Somebody gets their trade binder, their bag, their laptop, their camera, and pretty much everything else stolen, especially the one that was in Los Angeles. Honestly, I'm surprised somebody in Los Angeles didn't steal the actual hosts hosting the stream, like the people themselves, and hold them for ransom. It's freaking Los Angeles. Might as well have held the damn thing in Rio. Oh my god, then he'd get kidnapped and get Zika. So yeah, I mean, you know the people you play with. They're probably not there to steal your stuff if you've seen them every single Friday for the last year. But all these unknown people, I mean, they might just show up to do all kinds of shady crap and then disappear. And they could be traveling from who knows how far away. And maybe they're not there to steal stuff, but then they see your trade box her out you're in the bathroom and boom they take off with it because you know it's just there it is they need money you know you don't know the person and they ain't coming back so keep an eye on everything you own keep an eye on everybody there that you don't know and um don't act distrustful don't act rude to them i mean you want them to come back and play f and m you want to be friendly and you want to build a community and this is like the big outreach thing where if they like everybody there and they like your local gaming store they might start coming back for f and m then you got more players and more variety and decks more people to trade with so you know don't don't be a dick, but, you know, what do they say? Uh, plan for the worst and expect the best or something like that? I might have gotten that backwards. Let's use my version of it. 
Everyone's sketchy and a potential criminal until they prove they're not. Now, there's only really one more final tip that I can think of that I haven't mentioned in a past video, and this one's pretty good, too. The number one tip I can give is don't be afraid to call a judge over. Just kidding, do be afraid to call a judge over. You should be extremely afraid to call a judge over because in all likelihood, it's going to be your typical level one judge that did not look up any of the new mechanics, has no idea how they work, and they're just going to read the card and give you their best guess instead of anything based on any kind of research or information online or any kind of card rulings. Under any other circumstance, I would call a judge because judges usually know what's up, especially, you know, once the cards have been out and they've been reading up on them and following the decks and watching Grand Prix and all that. But the first place I would go with a question is, um... Basically, anybody you know who absolutely did memorize the mechanics and seems to know really, really well how they work because, you know, they're a little bit better off than the judges. Or see if you can find a card ruling on the Gatherer. Uh, I don't remember if those are posted at that time or not. Um, I think they are, though. So any kind of card ruling will be right below the card, and you can look up exactly how it works. And that usually settles really particular stuff about how certain card mechanics work. You know, especially with Tree of Perdition. I mean, there's all kinds of, oh, what if I turned it into a 1-1? One, one? And then when, when does it check? Does it recheck the toughness? You know, at cast time or, you know, it's just a mess. That whole card's a mess. I think I already know what the um, card rulings are going to say, but nobody ever takes my word for it. So if you can, bring a smartphone or have a friend nearby with a smartphone so you can start looking up rules, rulings, questions, even forum posts about the card. You never know what you got to find. Um, it's usually better than just one judge's opinion. Now, you guys might have really good judges that stay on top of it and study for it and all that. So I'm not saying all judges are clueless, just most of the ones I've met. So that about wraps it up. Um, I have a couple other videos on this channel about uh, pre-release tips, and uh, a lot of them are not specific to the set. So if you watch them, you might get even more tips. Otherwise, there's a ton of other YouTubers out there that have been to a lot of pre-releases that I haven't, or I should say a lot more than I have total. And they made some excellent videos, so just uh, probably look at the suggested videos. Otherwise, just type in MTG pre-release tips, and you'll probably find some great videos. And I'll see you guys next video.